The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm actually quite surprised at the turnout. I figured with Mark Spencer talking, I'd have three or four people present. We could all just get around, around a circular table or something. But um, as Rick said, I am a, a teacher uh, by trade. Please don't hold that against me. Uh, I do what I can, but, you know, working for the government some days is it's a tough job. But um, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Pardon me. Uh, as we go through this, uh, first of all, this is intended to be an introduction. Um, you know, those of you that are already familiar with IP tables and, and that sort of thing, to be honest with you, you're not going to get anything new here. Um, so perhaps you might want to go to Mark's presentation. Um, otherwise, if, if you don't know a whole lot about IP tables already, then I'm hoping that this can be kind of a... a a good introduction, uh, certainly not going to get you writing any full-fledged firewall scripts uh, when you leave, but uh, a good start to, to an understanding anyway. So with all that said, let's see if I can figure out this uh, different PDF application. Uh, to make a long story short, I have my laptop down here, and I just upgraded uh, the XORG to what at some point will be 7.5 as you know it's not out yet and um, I guess there's still a few rough edges because the full screen presentation mode cuts off right past the slash at the end of the slackware.com website link and unfortunately I do have some text to the right of that on some of these slides so that wasn't going to be very useful to us so anyway um, first of all a general overview of firewalls uh, you know what is a firewall this is something that it's really easy but difficult to answer. It depends, uh, and really it depends upon your background, where you're coming from. Um, I don't know how many of you are coming out of a Windows background, probably lots of us, uh, maybe maybe not ideally, but uh, traditionally we tend, tend to think of a firewall as something that looks at network traffic and uh, determines whether it's allowed or, or denied uh, based on a rule set of some sort. Um, Application level filters, these are things that usually we think of zone alarm, checkpoint, other firewalls that that I guess a lot of people probably have on their Windows machines or would have had on their Windows machines or even should have on their Windows machines. That's not what we're going to be focusing on today. We're looking at more of simple packet filters. Um, IP tables on Linux, PF on OpenBSD. Um, modern packet filters, they're going to have some more advanced capabilities, uh, network address translation or NAT, um, altering packet headers, uh, deeper inspection of packet contents. Some of that becomes useful. And it, just as an example, altering packet headers, there I don't think this is very common anymore, but back in, I don't know, five to six years ago, a lot of ISPs, at the beginning of the wireless, when wireless started becoming popular and people setting up home networks with their internet accounts, um, ISPs tended to want to charge extra money if you wanted to run a home network. So they would charge, say, $10 or $15 or whatever for the router and to give you extra IPs. And um, what what you can do with IP tables is is essentially every packet going out of the network gets a time to live header set. And ISPs would look at that time to live header, and if they were detecting different time to live inc or, or settings on on different packets, they would start dropping uh, your traffic. So what you can do with IP tables and probably PF and others is basically reset all those time to live headers of everything leaving your network, so that as far as your ISP is concerned, everything's coming from the same box. But um, Anyhow, so we're going to focus on the simple packet filter, which is IP tables. Um, just an overview of the packet filter framework in the, in the Linux kernel. It's divided into two parts. You've got the kernel space, which is net filter or, I, or X tables, and then the user space portion, which is IP tables. Generally, we refer to them together. It's just plain old IP tables. Come on. Um, kernel configuration. This is a touchy subject. Just out of curiosity, how many of us here have built custom kernels? 
How many of you still do that as a matter of habit? <laughs> One. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay, well then, this isn't necessarily bad advice, I don't think. Um, use your distributions kernel, seriously. Um, I'm not saying that building a custom kernel is a bad idea, but to be honest with you, unless you have some legitimate need for it, as in there's driver support in a newer kernel that you have to have, or there's a bug in your distributions kernel that is fixed in a later one, you probably don't need to build a custom kernel. And based on my experiences in distro development, lots of people get them wrong. And then they report bugs. And we spend insane amounts of time tracking down bugs that, quite frankly, aren't our bugs. And that gets frustrating. So use your distro kernel, if at all possible. Um, if you do build a custom kernel where firewalling stuff is concerned, you're almost surely going to want to set all of the net filter options as modules. Uh, the advantages of that, just at a high level, is if you build things statically into the kernel and you need support for something new that you didn't build into it, you have to rebuild the kernel. Or if you, um, just as an example, you have a problem with a with this doesn't really apply to IP tables, but you have a problem with a driver that, that goes crazy, uh, you can just unload the module and reload it rather than having to reboot the whole system. And usually that works out well. So generally speaking, uh, keep all the stuff as modules. That way if you need support for something that you didn't think you were going to need when you built your kernel, it's, it's already there. You just load a module. Um, X tables and net filter. This, uh, the name IP tables actually comes from the fact that there are tables that are built into the, the kernel. These tables are filter table, and this does exactly what the name implies. It's where the actual packet filtering takes place. If you don't specify, I hate touch pads. I'm sorry. I have no idea how to go back either. So, okay. Well, anyway. If you don't specify a table, this will be, that will make more sense here in a little while than the filter table is actually what is implied if you don't specify one when entering a rule. Uh, you have the NAT table. This is network address translation table. That's where rewriting packet source or destination takes place. And then the mangle table. That's where you alter packet headers or contents if, if need be. Each table, oops, forgot about one, the raw table, um, that's really, again, what the name implies. It uh, looks at the raw packets as opposed to, um, well, that, that's really not a good explanation. It doesn't do anything special to the packets as they come in. Um, this is where you can tell the co whole connection tracking system to ignore this packet and, and everything else associated with it. Each table has some built-in chains. These chains are the input chain. Um, the part about where it's present really isn't important for our purposes at this point. And I'm going to go ahead and bring up all three of these, I hope. In the input chain, only packets that terminate on the local host go through the input chain. That part is, is really important, and I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. The output chain, again, what's present isn't really terribly important at this point, but only packets originating on local host traverse the output chain. And then the forward chain, packets that don't originate or terminate on the local host traverse the forward chain. Now, to go back and summarize this, quite frankly, this is probably the biggest sticking point that new users or new people trying to figure out IP tables run into problems with. And I know this because I was there, I remember. Um, a lot of people come into, and I, I frequent the IP tables uh, IRC channel, and, and this is one of the, the biggest, I guess, most frequent issues that comes up is people get a nice rule set with everything they want to accept into their network in the input chain and everything they want to go out in the output chain, which uh, we'll talk about output chain filtering later on, and then say, well, my firewall can connect to the Internet fine but nothing behind it seems to get out to the Internet. What's wrong? 
Well, what's your forward chain look like? Because, see, the input chain is only dealing with packets that are actually terminating, ending at the firewall. Anything going behind it, or supposed to be going behind it, is not affected by input chain rules. And the same goes for output. It only applies to packets that the firewall itself is creating. Everything else is forward chain. And the forward chain is where things behind the firewall, things on the other side of the firewall, all traffic between those two goes to the forward chain. So just keep that in mind. That will be important later. Uh, also, two other built-in chains that may or may not be useful depending on what you're doing are the pre-routing and post-routing chains. Again, exactly what the name implies, pre-routing, before routing. Um, packets go through this chain before routing decisions made by the kernel. Pre-routing is handy for port forwarding, something that you tend to do on your commercial routers if you've got a host in your network running a web server and you want to forward everything on port 80 to that particular host, then you'll do that in the pre-routing chain of everything coming into your network. Uh, Post-routing is where a network address translation, for example, to take an internal network where everything is on just, for example, 192.whatever IP a private address range going out to the Internet. Um, obviously, if a packet goes out to the wild, wild Internet with a 192.168.whatever address, the next router past you is going to barf on that. Pardon my language. Because, obviously, 192.168.whatever there's millions of them out there, and they're not intended to be used on the Internet as a whole. So before that packet leaves your network, your firewall, your gateway, essentially, needs to do something to it to make sure it knows or it knows where to go from there, and more importantly, where it's going knows how to get it back or get the response back. So this is where post-routing comes in. Once the routing decision's been made, that packet's being sent to Google.com, and it's, it's routed out. Before it actually leaves the network, the, the kernel will rewrite the source address of the packet, where it's coming from, to be the external IP address of your gateway box. And then it goes out so that the next router upstream knows where to send it, the replies back. And I hope that made some sense. I, I, I sometimes tend to ramble when I'm talking. But you know, that's, this is where outgoing NAT happens, is in the post-routing chain. Next is basic IP table syntax. Um, most of this, to be honest, is cut and paste from the IP tables man page. And that's a hint. If you need help, go there. It's a great place. Um, to add or delete a rule, um, here you go. As an example, IP tables, dash T filters, so on and so forth. This will, actually the first one, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Note that dash A means append. This rule is added to the end of the chain. I have no idea how to go back. Oh, that's how. Okay, good. Um, what these two examples do, we'll come back to this in just a moment, but... This is appending a rule to the input chain. Um, that's protocol, so it's the TCP protocol. Destination port of 22, and it's jumping to the accept target. Uh, there'll be more explanation on this later, but basically what this rule is doing is accepting packets to the typical SSHD port. Um, the next rule would delete the corresponding rule that we just inserted. And this note down at the bottom, that'll be important later. We're going to touch on that quite a bit more. But long story short, if you have if you have a rule set and you do an a, a dash A and a pin, the rule is tacked onto the end of the rule set. Uh, next is to insert a rule at a particular place in the chain would work like this. This would take a rule to accept traffic on port 110, TCP protocol, at position number two in your rule set. 
Instead of tacking it onto the end of the chain, it tacks it on at position number two and bumps everything below that down one. You can also delete a rule from a chain by the rule number. Um, this particular example command would delete rule number two. In other words, it would delete what we just added in the previous slide. Of course, the question at this point, yeah, question. The question at this point probably becomes, well, how do I know what's at rule or what's at position number two? And probably you'd want to use the line number switch and the dash L, which is the list command, to get the line numbers. Go ahead, sir. I assume that these rules are all processing Yes, we're, we're going to touch on that. And, well, assuming time constraints don't play an issue, but yes, they, they are. And, and we'll touch on that more later. It's... One of those things where it's hard to talk about that without the basics in place, but you are indeed correct. Um, flushing rules from a chain, uh, if you want to clear out all the rules you have, something like this. Uh, these particular examples, the first one is going to clear out the filter tables input rules. The second will clear out the NAT tables uh, post routing chain rules. Um, if you want to zero the packet counters, uh, packet counters basically a nice troubleshooting tool. Um, it's more often than I would like that I put in the perfect set of firewall rules and the darn things still don't work. And this is where you look at packet counters to find out exactly which rules are seeing packets. And if those perfect firewall rules are seeing zero for the packet counters, maybe they weren't so perfect after all. And and then you look at which ones are seeing packets that shouldn't be and give you some sort of hint as to where to look. Um, note that earlier the default chain, if you don't specify one, is filter. And that also applies to this particular command. We could have actually left off. I hate touchpads, just to remind you of that. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to give that up. We could have left off the part dash T filter because that's, that's implied if you don't say anything. <clears throat> if you want to set the default chain policy, here's how you do it. As an example, this would set the filter tables input chain policy to drop. Uh, the way the chain policies work is if no rules match or if your packet doesn't, or if a packet coming in doesn't match any of the rules, that are set up, this is what happens to it. It gets dropped or accepted depending on what you set the chain policy to. Um, oops. We'll talk more later on suggested policies for each chain um, because there are some, some pros and cons to how you set your chain policies and we'll try to get some time to touch on those. Uh, creating custom chains, again here's the syntax on that. Um, Basically, this will create a custom state chain in the filter table. Uh, I'll try to touch on, again, this is all going to depend on time, but usage of custom chains and how they can be handy. Um, as the gentleman in the back earlier was mentioning about optimizing rule sets and how the packets are, or rules are applied in the order that they that they're occur or they entered. So... Ideally, you want your earliest rules to be the ones that the most packets are going to be matching against. Um, for example, if you know that this is a web server and most of the traffic it gets is on port 80, then you want to go ahead and have your early rules accepting all of that stuff because there's no need to compare the 90% of your traffic on port 80 against the rules for SSH, just as an example. And this is where custom chains come in you can early on go ahead and, for example, this state chain, create rules to match against established and related connections, knock those out because that's going to be the vast majority of your traffic anyway. But, again, more on that later. Um, if you create this state chain, obviously you're going to need to jump to that chain from some of your other rules, and there's how you would, there's how you would do it. And by the way, those of you trying to make notes, you really probably don't need to. I've got a copy of this presentation that I'll show you a link to at the end, and you can just pull it off the Internet. Um, there's no need to be making notes. Unless, I mean, it's your call.
Doesn't matter to me. But <laughs> my students would be appalled. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Deleting custom chains, exactly the same as creating them, except use the dash X flag or option. Um, just an example, remove the state chain we created earlier. Note that when you remove a custom chain, for example, this state chain, we can't have any other rules in our rule set that jump to that chain. It, if that chain basically is in use by other rules jumping to it, and IP tables is going to barf out an error for you and tell you that you can't remove this because it's in use or something along those lines. I think it'll be obvious. Um, planning. This is where we get into the nitty gritty. When you're working out a firewall rule set, um, you can certainly approach it from the let's just start writing this and see how it turns out. To be honest with you, I usually do it that way. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But ideally, you want to sit down and kind of plan out, you know, what's the intended purpose of the box? Is this going to be a firewall rule set for a, you know, a single workstation? Is this for a router gateway? Is it a multipurpose router gateway that's going to be running Apache and uh, FTP servers and so on and so forth um, and whatnot? So make sure you know what the purpose of the box, what is expected, what type of traffic is the box expecting? Because those are the things you're going to have to allow in on your rule set. Um, if it's going to be a router and gateway, are there any services inside the local network that have to be available to the outside? Again, this is where the you're running the web server on a separate box inside your local network. Or you've got a separate box that serves as just a secure shell gateway. Um, do you need to do egress filtering? In other words, do you need to filter packets leaving the local network? Um, my colleague Rob McGee has a saying that if you don't know how to do this without asking questions, that means you don't need to do it. Um, because it's really not as simple as it sounds, and yes, that's another of those things I learned the hard way. You can go through and open up port 80 and all the other things that you think you need for, you know, your browser's going to have to go out on port 80 and so on and so forth, and you think, I've got it. Everything's done. And Lo and behold, you forgot to open a, allow port 53 out. So you can't do any name server lookups, and suddenly nothing works. Um, and there's others. But egress filtering, depending upon your needs, probably isn't worth the effort. But as always, there's exceptions. And you know, there's always the academic reasons for doing it, just because, hey, I want to see if I can do this. And, and that's perfectly legitimate. Um, setting chain policy. Remember that chain policy decides what happens to packets when they fall off the chain. In other words, if the packet doesn't match any of the rules that it sees, the policy is what applies. If that policy is dropped, it gets dropped. If that policy is accepted, it gets accepted. Note that there is not a reject policy. This is also a common thing that happens when one uses reject as the policy. There's no such creature. And by the way, in case you didn't know, the difference between drop and reject. Drop, exactly what the name implies. The packet's just thrown in the garbage can. Reject means that an actual reply, some sort of acknowledgement that says, we didn't just drop this packet in the garbage. We're going to tell you we threw it in the garbage. It's, I guess, the Usenet equivalent of plonk, um, for those of you who are familiar with Usenet. Um, we're not just going to ignore your postings. We're going to tell you we'll ignore your postings. So... But there is no reject policy. So if that's what you want, this is where it can, becomes handy to create a custom chain called reject, put the particular reject uh, rules in that, and then jump to that reject chain. You're saying there's no implicit deny at the end of the list? Correct. Okay. Correct. That the, the end of the list, so to speak, is your chain policy. It's whatever you set. Um, and as far as what the default is, Honestly, that depends on how you, how you define default. The kernel default is accept everything by default. Uh, basically, the only exception to that would be forwarding packets. I believe the uh, IP forward to, uh, proc flag is always set to zero by default. But as far as if you build a vanilla kernel on a distribution that's not setting up firewall rules by default, everything's going to be accepted going out and in by default. Now, there are some distributions. I, I, I know for sure Red Hat, 
Uh, I can't say for sure on some of the others that do ship a default firewalls rule set that uh, may do various other things. And I really can't speak to what they might do. So that, those types of, as far as that would go, you need to go look at your distribution. Um, as far as default accept or drop policy, which one you need, depends on your needs. Uh, the recommendation tends to be that drop policy is better for your filter table so that if, I guess it's a security by default thing, that if for whatever reason you forget to explicitly configure a drop for something or you open up a new service on accident, uh, I know that's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to lots of other sysadmins where you're testing something and you forget that you left this service open that, you know, that IRC daemon that you were just going to play with and see if it would work. And then you forgot and left it open and suddenly you have all sorts of people on your IRC daemon. Um, so a default drop policy kind of mitigates the hazards associated with that because unless you explicitly open up a port to the outside, it's closed. But, you know, there may be some circumstances where you want that. It, it, again, that's, that's your call. Um, the output chain, again, this is where that comes up. Probably a default accept policy is better in the output chain. Um, rule order, this kind of touches on the question from the gentleman earlier. Rule order is important. Um, it, they are, the rules are applied to packets in the order in which the packets were at, or the rules were added to the, to the chain. Now, that's per chain. In other words, you add a rule to the input chain, you add another one, they're one and two. You add a rule to the output chain, that's a completely separate order. So it's not like every chain is, is looked at for every packet. Um, that goes back to the early part of this where uh, which chains see which packets versus source and destination and all that. But rule order is important. Um, just as an example, if you append, you tack on a rule to the end of the filter table's input chain, which says to, you drop some. But you tack on a rule to the filter table's input chain to drop packets on port 22, and then you say, oh yeah, but I need to accept port 22 because I want to be able to get in on SSH from such and such IP address. The problem you're about to experience is that you have a drop rule first for everything and then a more specific accept rule from bob.slackware.com or wherever the thing is that packet coming in is going to see this drop first so it's dropped your accept rule will never be looked at remember the packet counters hint this is where it comes in handy you see that the drop rule is seeing too many packets and the accept rule is not seeing enough and gives you some troubleshooting hints so the first matching rule wins. There is an exception to that. Um, there are some things called non-terminating targets. The log target, the U-log target, the no track, uh, there are a few others I think I mentioned the next in the presentation. Um, basically the idea is that if you want to log a specific packet, um, you don't want that to be the last thing that happens because if you log it, that means it wasn't accepted or it wasn't dropped or so what happened to it um, so those are non-terminating targets they don't end the processing doesn't stop there it goes on past that um, some other examples I mentioned log and you log no track uh, the mark target and some others any other one suitable for the mangle table probably the mangle table is one that most of us will never have any excuse me will never have any need to use uh, one good example of, of where it comes in handy, uh, any of you familiar with the concept of tar pitting a connection? Okay, a few. Um, basically, if you were going to tar pit a connection because of the way that works, you probably want to send those packets through the raw table's no track target first to tell your, the kernel not to track those connections. In essence, don't allocate memory to keeping track of these connections because you don't care about them. The idea is not to exhaust your system resources, it's to exhaust the other end's resources. So you don't want to track those, but that's just an example. Probably most of us won't have any use for that aside from um, general mischief and mayhem.
Um, the U log target, uh, for those of you that, for whatever reason, want to keep logs of what happens in your firewalling, probably you're going to want to look at uh, U log B. Oh, crap. Um, in order to use the U log targets, you'll have to have something called U log B. It was written by one of the old, uh, I say old, one of the early IP tables developers named Harold uh, Wilty. Uh, but it basically logs all of your uh, firewall rules into a separate file as opposed to spamming your, your um, I think it's var log messages is where everything would, would go by default. Um, but on that note, probably you don't want to really log much at all. Um, logging all dropped packets, while perhaps good from a statistical point of view, if you're just curious about what kind of traffic you're seeing from the Internet at large, or if you're doing troubleshooting and you actually want to see the drop traffic because you have something that doesn't work and it's supposed to, or you know, as an example, it doesn't work and your wife says it needs to, or husband, as the case may be, or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. I don't want to offend anybody too bad. Um, the point is, those types of cases are where logs might be handy. But honestly, otherwise, logs are just taking up space. Um, so you probably just don't want to log a whole lot. That's one of those things that usually stays commented out in my rule sets. Um, let me check the time. I'm sorry. I'd... Okay, we're in good shape. <clears throat> All right, so let's do a, a quick sample workstation rule set. Again, this is just for a single user workstation. Um, quite frankly, the gateway router, uh, it's a little too complex and, and too many choices that you would have to make to really get into an example of that here. And probably we don't have time anyway. Um, so just a sim uh, sample workstation here. We'll set our default chain policies. We'll set our input policy to drop, forward policy to drop, because, and the reason for forward to drop, remember, this is a workstation. This is my desktop or my laptop. There's no need for me to be forwarding packets from the Internet to any other box or vice versa because there are no other boxes behind it. So forward policy should just be dropped. Input drop, meaning everything coming to the laptop by default is dropped unless some other rule allows it. And we'll allow an output policy of accept. And more on that in a little bit. Um, I just said all that. Oops. Okay. So we got our chain policies. Probably first we want to remove any existing rules from our rule set. And that's how we do it. Since we did not specify a table or a chain, this rule defaults to use the filter table and all chains in that table. So these next three things, as you see, would do the same thing with a lot more typing. And because we Nix guys are inherently lazy, we use the first method, right? Okay, maybe not, but I do. I'm lazy, I guess. <clears throat> next, we'll allow all traffic on the loopback interface. Loopback interface, first of all, one of these is kind of redundant. Note that we have an output rule set to accept the traffic. But we just, in the previous slide or two back, we set the output policy to accept. So technically, we don't need this output rule. It, it's redundant. It doesn't serve any purpose. But here's why we did that. Sorry. Thank you. Glad your hearing is better than mine, or worse than mine as the case may be. Um, so we add this output rule just to be safe. Uh, basically, the loopback interface is how the machine talks to itself. Yes, they're all insane. They do that. And if you don't allow traffic on the loopback interface, bad things happen. And we'll just leave it at that. So you always want the machine to be able to talk back and forth to itself. Um, so we'll make sure we've done that. Next, we're going to tell the kernel to always accept incoming traffic that belongs to established connections and traffic that's related to established connections. 
Um, I think I've got a discussion in a little bit about more about what that means, what each of those means. If not, I'll I'll add a little bit. Um, but here's the rule to do that. Now note that this assumes that F0 is your internet connected interface. If it happens to be different, then sure, you use a different one. But each of these flags, um, the dash I flag is interface, the dash M specifies to load a some sort of module. We're going to load the connection tracking module. And then the CT state is a flag of the connection track module to, tell it to look at the connection tracking state established and related and accept those packets. Probably for almost everyone, you'll want that to be one of your first rules because the vast majority of the packets that you care about and the keys that you care about coming into your box are going to be in one of those two states. And so for optimization purposes, you'll want that to be one of your first rules. Um, Note that we didn't specify a protocol or a source and destination address or port. There may very well be an exception to this, but generally speaking, if you don't specify something, if you don't specify a protocol, the default is all of them. If you don't specify a source port, that means every source port. If you don't specify a destination address, that means every destination address. So <clears throat> in this particular case, we don't care where the packet's coming from, what port it's coming from, what port it's going to locally, what, you know, what protocol it is. If it's in one of these two states, established or related, it's okay with us. We want to go ahead and accept it. And, but you have to be careful with that. Um, there are some situations where you can pass incompatible options, and I'll give you an example in a couple of slides down. Ah, here we go. Oops. Um, the established connection probably is pretty self-explanatory, I guess, so not much explanation needed to that. Related perhaps isn't quite as self-explanatory. Um, FTP is a good example of where you need the related rules. Um, to summarize, FTP is, I guess you could argue, is an insane protocol in that you go out with the client to a server, and the server then connects back to you on a different port. And prior to connection tracking, and you had to basically open that, leave that port wide open. And so now, with this uh, connection tracking or state tracking, where you can say, if we make a connection to ftp.wherever.com, and then ftp.wherever.com tries to connect back to us on port 20, that's okay. That's a related connection. It's not part of the same connection because, well, it's not in the same stream, but it is related, and this tells the kernel to accept that. Um, ICMP error packets are also examples of related, or, well, usually examples of related packets. Um, so we usually want to accept those. I, I can't think of any, any valid reason why you wouldn't, but there's probably some out there, and if you know one, feel free to speak up. Okay, good. Um, as we mentioned in the previous slide, or actually it was two slides back, if something is not specified, then that basically the default is it means anything or everything. Just an example of incompatible options would be this. Anybody happen to see why? No one? Uh, you're almost there. Ah, there we go. That's the teacher coming out of me. Sorry. Um, so we didn't specify a protocol here, and that means any protocol. The problem is that some protocols don't have a concept of ports, and we also specified a destination port of 22. So since you, you obviously have a conflict here, you have rules for protocols without ports and specified a port, then that's, that's invalid. And that's the error that you'll see in the um, current version of IP tables. Older versions had a little bit different error, but it looked similar. But honestly, that's really not a good error message, is it? Sorry, I wish I could help, help you with those. IP tables, to be quite honest, 
the error messages usually aren't very helpful. It's one of those things that you just have to say, okay, there's something wrong. Let's go back and see if I can figure out what, as opposed to there's something wrong and this tells me what. Um, so anyhow, um, at this point, based on those few rules that we just added, we have a pretty functional and secure firewall. And notice I put that in quotes. But we have a pretty functional and secure firewall on our workstation. However, we might want to allow SSH connections from remote machines, so we'll do this. We'll add a rule to the input chain coming in on F0, on TCP protocol. The dash dash send means packets with the send flag set, or start a connection, to destination port 22. They are new in the, as far as the contract table is concerned. New basically means that we haven't seen any packets in this stream or, or connection before. This, this is the first one we've seen. And we want to accept those. And there's the shorter version of the long explanation. So now we have a secure and functional rule set, but sooner or later, we'll have to. Correct. Yes, correct. There are, there are other ways. Go ahead. Yes, and maybe, and yes. You ne wouldn't necessarily have to delete that rule. You probably would want to, but it being present wouldn't necessarily harm anything either. There are other ways that you can do that as opposed to setting up Secure Shell to uh, listen on an alternate port. Um, you could, this is where that pre routing table comes in handy also. Uh, just as a kind of handy hint for those of you who aren't aware, one thing that's neat to do a lot of places um, don't like opening up anything other than port 80 and 443 out of their network. So um, if you have access to a colo server somewhere or even your home system, the great thing about port 443 is it usually isn't subjected to a lot of inspection because it's expected to be encrypted. And if you take your secure shell daemon and run it on port 443, or even better, you can, or well, not necessarily better, another way is to use IP tables rules on the pre-routing chain coming in uh, to basically rewrite packets on port 443 from specific IP addresses like say that university that doesn't allow anything else out um, to just jump drop them back down to 22 and bingo you've got a nice outbound secure shell connection um, just in case any of you weren't aware usually that works out well for port 443 yeah There, no, but some of the newer stuff, and, and I didn't even cover it in here because, quite frankly, I'm not terribly familiar with it. I haven't had time to play with it yet. There is some IP tables XML stuff in the newer versions that, just from memory, that'll dump an XML version of a rule set, and I think there's some editing capabilities that are part of that. How well they work, or if I'm even entirely accurate on that, I'm not, I don't know. Um, but it's something to look at anyway. But generally speaking, at least based on what we've had today, no, there is no editing. The editing capability is you delete the wrong one and add a right one. Um, so, all right, so anyway, uh, so we've got this secure functional rule set we put in, but you know, we're going to have to reboot this thing sooner or later. And I don't know about you guys, but we're back to the lazy thing. I don't want to have to retype all that in. So we can put them in a script uh, on Slackware. Yeah, I'm a little more familiar with that than the other stuff. You put them in rc.firewall. Um, but, whoa, I wonder if I missed a slide. Maybe not. There's probably better ways to do that. More on that in a moment. I think it's later on. Some usage hints, and this, this touches on the question, uh, one of the earlier questions. Uh, I already mentioned this. You know, you, you want to organize your rules so that most of your traffic will be matched by earlier rules in the rule set. Um, you know, 
that, that probably makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, if you decrease the number of rules that a packet has to hit before something matches, then you're going to cut down on system resource usage. On that note, for your home firewalls, it really doesn't matter. Um, you're not going to see any difference on any, t any type of uh, halfway modern hardware, regardless of whether you optimize your rule sets or not. Um, for you know, a corporate firewall that's you know, seeing lots and lots and lots of traffic, sure. So you got to look at your needs. But um, Custom chains, as I mentioned earlier, can be very useful to decrease number of rules. A packet has to hit a um, little, little bit more advanced than probably what we'd have time or, or need to go through today, but just something worth looking into. You can do a lot of neat things with custom chains. Um, I mentioned the state chain earlier. I know on the Colo server that me and a couple other guys maintain, we've got you know a state chain and a uh, I think an admin chain that basically whitelists all of us uh, from our IP addresses, uh, a a custom reject chain, and and a few others. But there's a lot of things you can do to optimize your rule set using custom chains. And another example mentioned here is you know, there, there's no need to test stuff going you know UDP protocol traffic against the rules that only apply to TCP traffic. So you can do a little bit, a little um, segmenting there too. <coughs> um, those of you on dynamic IP addresses, hopefully, no, I'm, I, I wish, but how many of you still on dial -up? Any Anybody? Oh, wow. That's great. Where is the, uh, the dial-up definition of the right? So I guess it's uh, that's no, nah, that's a little different. Uh, it is, yeah, it is. But I'm not. I'm being, I'm speaking of traditional dial-up. Um, to, I'm I'm glad no one in here is. Just about two months ago, I finally was able to move up in the world from a dial-up connection. Yes, the old 56k dial-up. It's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> that's one of the hazards of living in the woods in rural Alabama. <laughs> it's great, except for internet. So now I have the nice Verizon broadband card, and it's certainly not super fast, but compared to three to four k per second, man, it rocks. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the mobile broadband card. I've got mine from Alto. How do you go about grabbing yours? Uh, I, stuff? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh yeah, it's it's actually plugged into my firewall and um, or gateway firewall, it, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's plugged into that and uh, you know, it comes up as a PPP zero interface. And as far as that, as far as your firewall rule set is concerned, it doesn't care what the it doesn't care about the low level details. All it cares is that you have a PPP device or interface rather, and your Ethernet interface is on the other side. You know, the the what the actual hardware is underneath that. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter. So, yeah, it works great. That's actually what we do. My wife didn't let me bring the Verizon card with me. She says I couldn't leave her without Internet. Um, so, um, and I don't blame her. She wouldn't have left me without it either. But, um, but yeah, as far as that goes, they work, they work just fine. Um, and I'll be more than willing to give you a hand with that if necessary. Uh, was that your question? <laughs> Sweet. Oh, you mean just to, to create a nice little inside the car network? Oh, yeah, I will. Get with me later today. I'll, it's, it's easy. Not a problem at all. Um, <clears throat> all right. So a lot of this probably won't apply to most of you since we don't have many folks on dial-up. Um, looking about 10 minutes left or so. Huh? Oh, Okay. Well, then, in that case, sorry, we're going to have to run through this. Uh, I'm going to put, let me get to the end, I promise, because this is, oh, come on. There's a few, there's a little more good information in here, I think. Yeah, I kind of do. Wow. The book I mentioned, this thing called Linux Firewalls, a lot more information than probably you'll need, but it's really, really a great book. Come on. This is worse than dial-up. Okay, maybe not. 
All right, down at the bottom is the address on my personal site where you can grab this PDF. And for those of you so inclined, there's the raw LaTeX uh, file that you could have a look at if you wanted to look at it for some reason. I don't know, maybe you want to hurt your eyes. But um, if you have any questions, I'm sorry I took so long. We'll try to get them now. If for whatever reason there's something that you need to ask that we don't have time for, catch me during the day. I'll be here. Yeah. yeah that web address is case specific, right? Uh, no. Well, the second part, yes. I'm sorry. It is. You know what? I'll fix that here in just a minute to put a sim link at the lowercase just in case. But any other questions? I hope you enjoyed. I hope it was worth missing Mark Spencer's presentation. Thanks, y'all. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, share alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.